Hey, it's Jess, and welcome to The Heart Strong, a podcast where we explore navigating the challenges in our lives. It's my personal mission to guide you towards your greatest potential. So come along with me as we explore living with courage, or as I put it, living heart strong. On today's podcast, I'm sitting down with Dr. Joseph Turek. Dr. Turek is a pediatric cardiac surgeon at Duke in North Carolina. He's a native of Illinois, which is my home state, and a graduate of Northwestern University and University of Illinois Medical School. He's done residencies at Texas Children and Duke, and his fellowship is at from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He also has an MBA from Duke. So all that's to say, he's incredibly accomplished and trained and busy, um, and he's published over 1,500 peer-reviewed manuscripts and book chapters, and he's pioneering some of the most important innovative techniques for pediatric transplantation, which is one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to him today. Um, As some of you know, my oldest son, Ethan, needed a heart transplant at age seven that he was unable to receive. And so a conversation like this is really special and personal to me because I think this work is really important. So a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed Dr. Ramamani, and I entitled that podcast, How Curiosity Shapes a Life. And so today, this is How Curiosity Shapes a Life 2.0. Um, and it's just a fun fact before we get started that Dr. Amani and Dr. Turk actually shared a, a dorm hallway at Northwestern University and did surgical training together at Duke. So it feels very appropriate that they would both be part of this conversation. And so welcome to the podcast, Dr. Turk. Thank you for your time. Oh, thanks, Jessica, for having me. Yes, I appreciate it. So today, I want to start our conversation right there about how curiosity shapes a life. And so I'd love for you to just get started by telling people how curiosity has shaped your life and how it continues to shape your life and the work you're doing today. Sure. Yeah, as you mentioned, I I grew up in in central Illinois. I grew up in a um, a one-stoplight town in in central Illinois, right by Springfield. And uh, I, I grew up in a family of educators. My mom was a was an elementary school teacher and my father worked in in Springfield with the Illinois State Board of Education. And so I've always had this this kind of a curiosity just from the the fact that I I come from a long line of of educators. And um, for me, uh, I think one of the things growing up that that I've unfortunately lost now, but I had an eidetic memory back when I was a child and I could I could see something and commit it to memory for the most part. it was one of those things where, you know, when when you have curiosity and you're able to see something uh, and be able to remember it uh, vividly, like you exactly where you saw it on the on the piece of paper, it it kind of sparks you to want to to learn more, and and you mm. uh, you're just trying to kind of fill your fill your vessel with as much knowledge as you can, and and um, you know, for me, I I found that I really like science. Um, I was I was especially curious and did a lot of reading and on the sciences and especially the life sciences. And coming from a small town, I realized I wanted more opportunity uh, in order to, um, um, to learn more and, and for education. And so, so I actually went to the Illinois Math and Science Academy, which is in, in Chicagoland, yeah. and it, it allowed me an opportunity um, to see more and, and do more. And that's really where, where my scientific curiosity took off. They had a program, uh, which it was a three-year school, so we were sophomores through seniors there, and they had a program where we could do a, a mentorship and actually learn uh, to do scientific research as, as early as, as being sophomores in high school. And so I started doing that, which led to summer research ventures and, uh, and ultimately led to me doing research throughout my not only high school career, but also uh, throughout college. Uh, and had me um, eventually apply to a, an MD, PhD program for medical school. So that's what I did for medical school. I did eight years of medical school because oh I was goodness. not only doing the, the MD aspect of things, but I was also uh, doing, doing PhD uh, doctorate work uh, as well. And so, you know, I've had this, I, I mean, I'm, ever since I started doing the, the scientific research uh, at the Math and Science Academy, I've been really hooked on uh, this whole idea of, of scientific curiosity and, and, uh, um, you know, it's, it kind of spills over into your, into your entire life. So for example, I, I, you know, got to the point when I was doing research that 
I would always just think of different things. And those, those thoughts would come to you at different times, those little innovative thoughts about, oh, here's what I'm going to do for these experiments. And uh, so I started pretty cell phone days. So I would keep, start <laughs> keeping notepads next to my bed, you know, because it was always at 2 a.m. when the real good idea hit. So then I'd right. start like that. And now it's on my cell phone notepads, and I still do it to this day and, and wake up in the middle of the night and put a, put a note in there about, about some scientific, you know, potential innovation or something that I want to test out or, or think about doing so. Well, that's interesting because you like leaned into your curiosity. It seems like you keep doing that. And it's always just interesting to me to talk to people like yourself. And I'm fortunate to know a lot of great people in the, in the medical field that, that have just leaned into that. And I think if you're listening and you're a young person and you have curiosities, like this is a great example, keep leaning into that because I have, I have a son that's 14 that wants to be a scientist. So, um, you know, he has ideas and books and drawings of things he wants to do. And I just love that you said that because I think we're all creative and curious in some way. And it's just so important to lean into that. So you went to medical school, you did their MD, PhD, you're a general surgeon, you're an adult heart surgeon, and you're a pediatric cardiac surgeon. I mean, that's, that's very unique. And so how did you get from general surgery to pediatric heart surgery? Like, where did that, how, what was that path like? Well, that was the traditional path. So okay. in, order, in order to be a, a, a pediatric heart surgeon, the traditional path is that you go through an entire general surgery residency, and then you okay. go and go through an entire adult cardiac surgery residency. And in fact, those are the two, my general surgery residency and my adult cardiac surgery residency, Dr. Amani, Amani and I were together on that. Okay, uh, and, and, very and then, cool. Then you do your pediatric heart. So if you think about it, um, you know, my path from the time I finished college uh, to get to be practicing pediatric heart surgery was 17 years wow. of training in wow. medical school residency trainings and fellowships. Yeah. It's a long path. <laughs> That's a very long path. I mean, and so how did you pick pediatric cardiac surgery? Well, how did that, I mean, you're such a curious person. How, why, would, why did that win out in your curiosity? Well, when I started, when I started doing um, scientific research and I was doing research in the summer, especially when I was a sophomore in high school, when I started off, I didn't have a lot of the background sciences uh, that were required from the research laboratory that I was working in. I was working in a pharmacology laboratory. I didn't even really know what pharmacology was at that point mm -hmm. in my life. And, and uh, I didn't have a lot of the, a lot of the biochemistry and, and some of the, the basic backgrounds that you needed. Um, so when they put me on projects, uh, I had to do a lot of reading, but, but they thought, well, we can, we can see how he does with some of the, some of the animal surgeries. And, um, mm -hmm. and then they realized that, I was pretty good at that. And uh, so I really started, um, that's, that was kind of the bulk of the work that I did is it just, you know, I was doing different kinds of um, nephrectomies and, you know, just, just all these operations. I was reading about them and they said, well, we'll figure out a model where we can do this uh, in this study. And then I would, I would go and read up on it and then I would start, you know, doing the experiments. And, and that really, a lot of that progressed, e even as I started to learn more about the actual science itself. Um, just that I was, I felt like I was, I was pretty good at, with my hands, and mm -hmm. so I knew I wanted to be a surgeon, and I knew I wanted to be a surgeon because of the research experience, actually. And I thought I was either wanted to do because I had done some some uh, neurology type work, and I had done some cardiac work, and so I thought when I went to medical school, I was going to either be a neurosurgeon or a heart surgeon. And I, I watched my first week of medical school, I, I watched both operations. And uh, for me, I, I was bored <laughs> watching the neurosurgery. Um, <laughs> the heart surgery was something when you see it and uh, you know that you were meant to do that. And what I really liked about pediatric heart surgery, and I had an inkling that that's what I wanted to do, is I really enjoyed the, the variety that we have in pediatric heart surgery. And it, it stays true today you know, I don't, won't do the same case in a month, uh, yeah. in, in my practice. And, and I love that. I mean, I think it's, uh, I, I love the variety. I love the challenge of pediatric heart surgery. Um, that's something that, that really, you know, interests me. And I think the other thing I really like about it, and this is what I tell trainees when they come through and say they might be interested is I actually really like the responsibility that comes along with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something you have to, you have to embrace in this field, uh, if, if you, you know, if this is your, going to be your path down the road is, is, to, is to embrace the responsibility that comes along with it. I mean, it's somebody's baby. It's somebody's child every time, every day. 
maybe multiple times a day. And um, it's got to be something you've, you've got to come to grips with and, and figure out how, how you're going to, to manage uh, those kind of things. So, so, you know, in, I was pretty clear that's what I wanted to do in medical school. I did spend a summer with Dr. Aldo Castaneda uh, down oh, yeah. in Guatemala. And Dr. Castaneda is, is a very famous pediatric heart he surgeon uh, who, was the, who was the chief at uh, Boston Children's uh, for mm-hmm. 25 years. And, and uh, he then, in his, quote, retirement, he, he founded the only pediatric heart program in Central America. And I was in medical school. He was down doing that program in, in Guatemala City. And I just reached out to him randomly one day and, wow. and asked if I could come down for a summer. And, uh, and he was incredibly gracious. And we, you know, we kept in touch over the years. He unfortunately uh, passed away a couple years ago. Yeah. Um, but, but I had a fantastic relationship with him. And he was, a, he was really one of, one of the most influential mentors in my, in my career. In your life. Wow, that's very cool. So let's talk about what you're doing today. The, there's three things that I want, three specific surgeries, if you will, or, or techniques that you're using that um, I think are incredible. And I told, uh, actually, I spoke with a friend of mine earlier today whose son just received a heart transplant. He's 14 and he's in the East Coast. So I told her I was going to talk to you today. And then I was talking to my husband about it too. And they, I mean, I just think what you're doing is so important. And so I want to ask you about it. And I'm hoping that people that are listening will learn about it too, so that if they um, want to reach out to you or your, your, your program that they can. Absolutely. So let's start and talk about partial heart transplantation. Will you like talk a little bit about what that is so people can understand it? Um, and then we can go from there with some questions that I have. Yes. Yes. And, uh, one way you can find out about it is it was featured on the Grey's Anatomy season. Yes, I heard premiere, about that. Actually. So they, they did a, a partial heart transplant episode, uh, which actually coincided to Meredith's last day at Sloan Great Oh, Sloan really? Memorial. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so you know, partial heart transplantation uh, is a it's an interesting term. Um, uh, we call it partial heart transplantation because we're not transplanting an entire heart. Uh, what we're doing instead is we're really just transplanting the top of the heart, which in the, what we mean by the top of the heart is we mean the two great vessels that come out of the heart, the aorta and the pulmonary artery and their associated valves. Okay. And the idea is, is that we're really doing a valve transplant in these cases. So for children who have s- valves that don't work, replacement is not an option in many cases. Um, the particular cases we've done that we've done the, you know, the two first world's first partial heart transplants, and they were both children who had a, a condition called truncus arteriosus. And truncus arteriosus is a fairly rare congenital heart disease in which instead of having those two great vessels that come out of the heart, you have one and you only have one valve that comes out of the heart. And when you have a child who has truncus arteriosus and they have a valve, that, that one valve that doesn't work, now all of a sudden you have, you, you don't have anything to repair this child's, this child's heart with. And so you could do a heart transplant in this case, um, if you had something like that. The problem is, is that a heart transplant in, in a child that age could take about six months in most institutions. And children who have truncus arteriosus with a really poorly functioning valve, they don't have that time. They might have, they might have two or three weeks at most wow. before something needs to be done. And so this was something that's been talked about for probably you know d- decades within our specialty. And the idea is, well, what if we just took the top, the valves out of the heart and um, we got them in a fresh fashion. So we procured them fresh like you would for a heart transplant. And then we implanted them while they're still fresh. And, um, and would they grow? And if you put them on a little bit of, put the child on some immunosuppression, anti-rejection medicine, would those arteries and valves be able to grow? And you know, there are a lot of hearts that don't go used, that go unused. Um, we do about 4,000 heart transplants a year in this country. And there's an estimate that an, at least another 4,000 hearts um, aren't used that, that find their way through the donation route, but we're unable to use the hearts for some reason or another. So I want to so, ask you about that real quick, yeah. because that was one of yeah. my questions. 
you know, yep. there's this idea that there's not enough hearts, right? I mean, it's kind of what, I mean, I went through the heart transplant workup with my son, you know, you kind of are told that as a parent, it's a, it's a privilege to receive one. It really is. Yep. And so what, you know, what is, so one question is, is that true? The second question is, it almost sounds like, are you discarding like the ventricles and the rest of the heart? Is that considered wasteful? So talk a little bit about that. Yes. So there is a heart transplant shortage. And unfortunately, um, you know, there are a lot of people who never make it off, off the wait list, as you know, and, and, um, and we, we do not, we cannot keep up with the, de- the supply cannot keep up with the demand for hearts at this, wow. at this point. One of the beauties of partial heart transplantation is that we don't use hearts that are, that are, would otherwise be used for heart transplantation. We only use hearts that for some reason are not suitable for full heart transplantation. And yet we're making use of, and otherwise that gift would not be used, yeah. uh, which is, which is really the beauty of it. So I think we can expand how we use some of these really precious gifts uh, in a very useful way in order to, in order to help, help children. And so um, the other piece about uh, the partial heart transplant is because we're not using the, the mass of the heart, you know, the muscle and the ventricle and the pumping chambers of the heart. Well, the muscle of the heart is really what, what ends up failing us when we have heart transplant rejection. It's the muscle. It's also the muscle that uh, is you know, very sensitive to, to, to coming out of the body and being able to, to work well if it's been too long between the time you get the heart and you, and you implant it. Mm-hmm. The, the, the beautiful thing about the valves is that the valves can actually stand more time in cold storage before you implant them. And it turns out when you do put immunosuppression on them, we, we proved this in, in piglets with my collaborator, Conrad Rajab down at Medical University of South Carolina, they grow. And, and the wow. valves grow and they remain competent and the arteries grow. And, you know, our first, our first child that we did this on, which was almost a year ago, um, he, both of his arteries and valves are exactly the size you would expect for the, for his size at this point. Wow. So it's, it's, it's really, it's really a miracle. I mean, the way, the way that it works and this is going to expand our opportunity uh, to use donated hearts that otherwise would not be used for transplantation. So what about the idea of other valves? Like for example, if you needed a mitral valve or an aortic valve in a kid, because I mean, my son had multiple, he had a Ross procedure and he had a couple of mitral valves and you know, those fail, they don't work after a while or there's anticoagulation issues, et cetera. So do you see this as an opportunity that a kid who needs a mitral valve or an aortic, that, that, that this could potentially work there also? I think so. So we've used them for, you know, the aortic and the pulmonary valves. Yep. And the question is, could we use them for mitra, the, the, in, the other valves, the, the mitral and the tricuspid valves? Yep. And I think there is a way you could do it. It's a little trickier, just the, the, the technical aspects of how you would do it. But, but your point is really well taken because not only like, you know, replacing a whole valve, but what we're doing is we're procuring fresh tissue that is still living. See, I think another name and probably a more appropriate name for what we're doing is living tissue or living valve implantation or tissue implantation, living tissue implantation. Because if you if you think you're procuring tissue that's still alive, well, heck, you could use that tissue and actually use it for patches. Maybe you want to augment your some arteries and patch those arteries. Well, that tissue could still be living after you implant it, whether it has valves or not. Or you could take mitral valve tissue and use it in a fresh manner, still alive, and use it to augment your mitral valve that maybe you're repairing it, that the patient, you know, you keep the patient's mitral valve, you repair it, and you use some extra tissue from a living source that you're able to to help your repair with. So I, I think you're right. I think there's a broad scope here you could use this for. Yeah, I mean, that sounds absolutely incredible. I know so many kids who have multiple valve tra- valve valve surgeries. Okay. So two things could this, cause I'm thinking of families yeah. that I know, could this be used for like pulmonary vein stenosis potentially? Right. Right. So yes. I mean, so one of the repairs for pulmonary vein stenosis, the surgical repair oftentimes has us cutting through the pulmonary veins right. 
and then we use a patch and we patch over these veins and then we hope that it doesn't scar down again where right. we patched it. Well, part of the reason it, it does scar down at times um, more often than we would like is because we're using non-living tissue as our patch material. So using living tissue has implications in everything we do in pediatric heart surgery. Um, the, the valve issue is interesting because the valve issue has also has this growth component to it. Right, uh, exactly. And, and the, you know, the fact that, that you, these, these valves will actually grow with you over time. And it's, it's possible that, for example, these two children that we've done the, the truncus um, partial heart transplants for, uh, it's possible those children may never need another operation again. Wow. And, uh, and what kind of anti-rejection? That's incredible. I mean, that's life-changing. Yeah. So what it kind is. of anti-rejection meds do those kids need? Is it the same as having a full so, transplant? We don't think so. Um, and, and in our in our piglet studies, uh, they do definitely do not need uh, that much immunosuppression. Uh, right now, um, these children are babies still. Yeah. And I have a real problem backing down their immunosuppression to the point because sure. I just I do not want to convert these perfectly functioning valves and perfectly growing valves and arteries into non-living tissue that is going to, that's going to stop growing. And so I, I think unless we start to have some issues with the, um, with some side effects due to our um, anti-rejection medications, I think we're going to wait until we really um, figured the science out and mm -hmm. we're very comfortable about where we are um, with, uh, with the actual regimen of immunosuppression. So how did you come up with this idea? What, was there a problem that you were presented that you thought, well, I should give this a try? Or like, where did it, where did this come from? Yeah, this has been, it's, this idea has been talked about for a long time. Okay. Um, and, you know, people thought, well, if we, because a heart transplant grows yeah. with children, right? So why right. would not, why would a part of the heart not grow uh, with children as well? And so this, this concept's been around for, you know, 40 years or so that the, the idea, but it's kind of, logistics are really difficult to figure out how are you going to do these logistics and and so you know we we started working with like i said with our collaborators down at um, medical university of south carolina and we started doing these piglet studies and i think what we realized was um, this could have broader implications and it can have broader implications because it's not going to take full transplant immunosuppression down the road for these patients right. so you could use it for patients who didn't have a a real d dire need for something to be done in infancy, you could actually use it. You could think of the child that had a tetralogy of Fallot repair with a conduit that's no longer working and uh, you want to put a new conduit in that's going to grow with them and then they won't have to get another replacement down the road. Mm -hmm. And so um, so I think you'd feel more comfortable doing that if you could do it with, um, with that. So with, with lower immunosuppression. Yeah. So in that sense, you know, I felt very comfortable with the, the data we had. And, uh, and then it really became just figuring out all the logistics. How do you, how do you um, make it happen? You have to go through regulatory boards. You have to talk to the, the UNOS, United Network of Organ Sharing, and figure it, make sure that they're okay with all of this. You have to talk to the organ procurement organizations across the country. When we, um, when we were looking for these, we sent letters out. We just blasted letters out to all of the organ procurement organizations across the entire country with the idea that we weren't really limited by a range because we yeah. knew that these valves and arteries actually stayed living even for long periods of time on cold ice storage. So we were able to, to really put that out there and um, we had, you know, we had to get approval from, from our institution and from our institutional review board. And so it was, I think ultimately this became a, a this became a logistics type problem uh, and we pregame too. So that was the other thing. So nobody had ever done this particular operation before. And I, I really wanted to make sure that if we were going to offer this for the first time, that we figured out how to do it. So we actually took um, CT scans of patients with truncus arteriosus, and we printed them out in a, in a very kind of a moldable plastic um, substance. And then we got like old pig hearts, and we practiced procuring just the top part with the valves and the arteries. And then we practiced our implantation technique. Wow. And we did about four of these before we ever had um, 
so we pre-gamed the entire thing with with simulation and and uh parts and, and models so wow um, just to that make sure it incredible. worked out I mean, yeah, yeah. It really I, that's i i just i think this is this has so many amazing implications for families so keep going with that. I mean, it, it's, it's incredible. So I want to go on to the next one that I have is um, the transplant post circulatory death. And, you know, I thought yeah. this was interesting because it kind of, you kind of alluded to it before a little bit that you weren't limited by geography. Cause that's a big thing. When you need a heart transplant, you have to be located for those of you listening who don't know within a certain time frame of where the heart's coming from. And it, it's a very big logistical situation. And so, you know, when the patient goes to the OR and, and, and all of the things. And so, you know, talk a little bit about this idea um, and, and, you know, where you think this can fit for patients, too. You're right. It's so, so you know, heart transplantation is, is the ultimate near traffic control. You know, you're really <laughs> trying to figure out and everyone's coordinating and, and uh, yeah. it's really it's, it's a pretty incredible um, process. And and. Uh, and it's very resource dependent as well. Um, so one of the problems we have, so part of the reason why um, we are not transplanting all the hearts that we could potentially transplant is because there's there's something called a deceased donor rule. And the deceased, the way the deceased donor rule it, uh, states is you have to be um, considered, ha- have died a brain death and it has to be declared, you know, by a medical professional, actually two medical professionals, um, that that you have died of a brain death in order to be able to um, donate um, your organs, whether it's a heart or, or any other organ. However, there are actually a lot of people that don't necessarily meet the criteria for brain death, but we all know that there's no, you know, there's really no chance for any meaningful life at that point. And yet there are families who still want to be able to donate these organs. And, and there are patients, as we know, who need these organs um, for life. And, and so that's where this idea of what's called, we call it DCD. So donation after circulatory death came about. And the way that DCD works is that um, these patients aren't technically brain dead. So they have to die a circulatory death before you can procure their, their organs. Can you give a quick so, example of what that would yeah. be for, for people listening? Like what would, what, what's a scenario like that? Right. So what we would do is um, if we were going to, to have a patient with donation of circulatory death. Um, so let's say a, a, a patient, someone gets in a car accident um, and sustains a, you know, a terrible head injury. However, the organs are good. But when they're looking at EEG activity and they're having a neurologist evaluation, there is a little bit of, you know, brain activity. And so, but we all, but we know that this isn't going to have, you know, meaningful life. They're not going to ever be off the ventilator. They're not going to be able to ever be able to communicate. Um, and so they can donate their organ. And so what would happen is that they would go to the operating room for donation. And what you do is you withdraw life support. And then you wait and they actually have us as the surgeons, we're waiting in an adjacent operating room and they withdraw life support and they wait until the patient passes away with their heart stopping. And that's the circulatory death. And then there's a, there's a standoff period of time. And it's a, it's usually about five minutes at most in most States where you have to wait five minutes after the patient has, um, has died a circulatory death, a cardiac death. And then you, you rapidly go into the operating room, procure the organs and use them for transplant. So that's the process. It's really, it's pretty crazy. I mean, the whole, the way that it all plays out. Um, And what you've got to imagine, let's think about a heart. So when we go and procure an organ in a normal transplant on a patient who's actually, you know, um, has has been declared uh, with brain death, when we procure those organs, it's a very controlled fashion. So we get in there and we make sure that we put a solution through the heart to stop it so it's nice and preserved and it's going to work really well. And, and then we put it on ice and we, we bring it back to the institution and do the transplant. With these, the heart's been stopped for at least five minutes. Um, and it's probably not been doing well for maybe an extended period of time before it actually stopped. And so when you get in there, that heart doesn't look good. The heart does not look good at all. And you don't know 
because his heart's no longer working, you don't know if this is going to be a suitable heart for transplantation. So we need to come up with ways where we can assess whether or not this heart is going to be suitable to give to our patient who needs this heart. And so there's two ways right now that we do that. So one of them is we use machines that we, we say reanimate the heart. So what you can do is you can, you know, take the heart out of, you know, the, of the donor and you put it on this machine and the machine is a pump and it basically allows the heart to pumps blood through the coronary arteries of the heart. You kind of put it on this, on this machine and, uh, and then the heart starts to wake up when it, when it gets blood flow through its coronaries and the muscle starts to, to wake up and, oh. and start to pump again. And so you are, we call it reanimating and you're watching this heart and you're saying, wow, this, you know, it looks good. It's this heart's reanimated. It looks completely normal. And, um, and the nice thing about those devices is then you keep it on that device and you fly back on the plane with it on the device. So it's getting blood flow the entire time wow. that you, that you bring it. And then you end up putting it in the patient at the end. So these are, so situations. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm so for, yeah. so there are situations, this would be in the camp of the hearts that might not be used that you'd mentioned in the yes. beginning of, the, of our conversation. Is that where these DCD situations exist? So this creates more opportunity for this is, like, this a patient. Been, this is, yeah, this has been a big advance in expanding the donor pool and, and, um, and they've done a lot of it on the adult side. Um, we're in our infancy in the pediatric side, you know, so we did the first, the first one in the U S uh, about a year and a half ago on a pediatric patient where we did this same thing. We took the heart out from DCD and put it on a device. Now our pediatric patient was a, was a large, was a larger child. And so we were able to use the device because these devices are made for adults. And unfortunately, that's what we deal with in pediatrics yes. is we don't necessarily have these devices and technologies that are developed for kids that are developed for adults. And so we had to get compassionate use in order to be able to use this for our child um, in order to do do the heart transplant. And, and so, um, you know, and so that's a problem that we have. The other problem we have um, right now is, so what are you going to do for the babies um, and how are they going to? going to get DC? How are we going to expand the donor pool for the babies when we don't have a device uh, for the babies? And so there's another technique that we use, and it's called um, the abbreviations NRP, and that is um, normothermic regional perfusion. And the whole idea here is that there's not a device that's going to take care of a baby heart and reanimate it. So what we do is when we fly to the donor site, we bring the entire team that would normally do ECMO or life support oh, wow. uh, for the patient. And we bring our ECMO circuit. And so then we reanimate the heart inside the chest. Oh, wow. So we don't have to put it in a device. We just connect the ECMO. We make sure that we, we don't, you know, we have to clamp the head blood vessels because we don't want to reperfuse the brain. I mean, that's, that violates the, the deceased donor rule. So mm -hmm. we have to clamp the head vessels but then we can reanimate the heart in the chest and uh, see if it works. And so we performed in, in October uh, or somewhere near the end of last year, we performed the, the first one of those in the U S with, with, and transported it from a, from a uh, remote site. So and does you the can't site transport have, them. With that. Yeah. yeah. Does the site have to be as close? Is there, are there those rules for how, like where, how close was have the to site? Be, you have to be closer so you have to, it wasn't that close, but we were, okay. it, we were kind of on the outer limits of where we were a good couple hours away. It was, um, the problem with NRP and the problem with not having a device for pediatric patients is that you can reanimate the heart, but you sure can't transport a long ways because you have to eventually put it on ice again. Right. And, uh, and then transport it to where you, where you're doing your transplant. I was actually up at the, uh, I was up at the NIH, um, last week at the beginning of last week. And that there was this, dis we had this discussion, we had a working group talking about both DCD heart transplant, as well as um, xenotransplantation, so animal organ transplants. Mm -hmm. so and interesting. the idea, and it came up about, you know, that this needs to expand more to the pediatric population and how we need to, to make sure that we have these technologies available for our kids. Sounds like we need the company that does the helps with the reanimation for adults to make a device for kids. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm right? working on them. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you are. Yeah. <laughs> I can yeah. imagine. So yeah. let's also talk about the the heart thymus transplant because that's another thing that you're doing. Um, yeah. And I, I read about or watched a video about a little boy named Easton. And so tell us about about that and uh, you know how that how you came up with that idea as well. Yeah, the, the heart the heart thymus uh, transplant was really. Um, you know, kind of serendipity uh, with the way that that worked out. So, you know, I, I'd have to give most of the credit for that uh, to my former um, research colleague, Louise Marker. So about 30 years ago, uh, Louise had the idea. So the thymus, for, for those who don't know, the, the thymus sits right on top of the heart, the top part of the heart, actually. And the thymus is, we, Louise always used to say, it's the schoolhouse for, for our T-cells. Our T-cells are what fight infection, right? And uh, so there is a subset of children who were born without a thymus, um, and they, they don't make T-cells. And unfortunately, those children, it was a, it was a universally fatal disease. Um, by the time you were two, you would succumb to some overwhelming infection because you didn't have that immune system. And so Louise came up with the idea. She said, well, what, what if we were able to, in some way, you know, do a thymus transplant? You know, you can call it. And, and what she ended up doing is coming up with this idea where we would culture thymus and then implant it into these children. And sure enough, I mean, it's been an incredibly life-saving um, innovation that, that's been around now for, for a, a good amount of time. Duke is still the only place in the entire Western Hemisphere that does thymus uh, implants, uh, culture thymic tissue implants for kids. And they've, they've treated, you know, over a hundred and some patients, uh, and, and really changed their lives, really changed yeah. their lives. And so, um, the interesting thing is they get the thymus from, from the pediatric heart surgeons, because when we do pediatric heart surgery and we're trying to access the aorta to put in our, our bypass cannulas, the thymus is in the way. So we usually remove part of it. And Louise has used that you know, thymus removal that we do, because we would normally just remove the thymus and kind of get rid of it. It's, we don't need all of your thymus to be able to have a good immune system. And she started, you know, getting consent to obtain that thymus and culture it and ultimately treat patients with it, which is really wow. a pretty neat, uh, a neat concept. So when I came to do this, this whole serendipity is that, is that Louise approached me and said, I think that there's a possibility that, you know, not only does the thymus make T cells that fight infection, but the T cells are also what play a role in rejecting organs that are not, you know, not your own. So they, they, they play a role in transplant rejection. So her thought was, well, what if we were able to retrain the immune system uh, in transplanting a heart by also transplanting that concomitant thymus from that same patient? And could we not only give the patient what they need, which is a heart transplant, but maybe this is a heart transplant that wouldn't reject uh, because wow. it recognized it, 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 that new heart as self. And so we, we did, a, did a number of studies um, in this light and, and we've, we've working on a lot. You know, we have a, a number of different models that we've been working on and trying to progress the science. And then all of a sudden Easton came along and Easton had single ventricle heart disease and it was a really... A uh, real difficult case uh, where he had a leaky valve that we just couldn't seem to fix and finally got to the point where we said, you know, that Easton needed a heart transplant. And so we, we listed Easton for a heart transplant. And unfortunately, he kept, we kept having to pull him off the heart transplant list because he kept getting infected. Mm. And so our, our immunology team came in and found out that Easton had really low T cells, very, very low T cells. And so, um, you know, it's, I think that, you know, innovation trait, it really favors like the trained mind, somebody who's yeah. like thinking about these things and, and has this, you know, one foot in the clinical, one foot in the research. And, and when I heard that, I said, well, this is it. This is the, this is the child. This is the one where we can offer him a heart transplant and offer him a new immune system. And in the process, we can actually test whether or not we can get tolerance or be able to recognize his heart as self by, by doing this. And so we, we did at that point, we did the world's first thymus heart transplant. And that was, that was a good, about two years ago. And uh, Easton's doing great. He's on very low dose immunosuppression right now, one agent and about half, less than half dose for that one agent. Uh, he has no signs of rejection on any of his biopsies uh, that he's had to date. And uh, it's, it's really a, you know, an incredible success story. He has normal T cells, 
normal T cell function. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a, it's been really, really exciting. So we're looking at, we're looking at, we're doing more studies in the laboratory, but we're actually looking at doing a clinical trial, um, using uh, co-transplantation of thymus and heart. So if you had a child who, who had normal T cells but needed a heart transplant, are you still doing the thymus heart in those kids too because it's preventing rejection of the received do- organ? That's the idea. Um, okay. That's the idea. But it, you know, it does set up an interesting scenario in the sense that you, you have to be very confident that you can reconstitute that immune system because you have right. to ablate the immune system Right. Before you do this so that you don't get that competition. So you have to be very confident. That's why we're, you know, we're, we're carrying out these experience, experiments so that we can feel good about doing this. And, and then we have to be careful about which patients we pick to do this. I, I think probably some of these high risk babies that have single ventricle heart disease mm-hmm. uh, that are likely going to need heart transplants anyway at some point might be mm-hmm. the best uh, the best cohort. Mm-hmm. So the other thing that I'm it just kind of popped to my mind is, you know, in, in complex congenital heart disease, oftentimes children will have multiple surgeries through the course of their life. And it's seen, you know, and there's, I know there's different points of view on, do we keep doing operations? Do we transplant early different centers, different people I know have different points of view on that, but yep. this, these techniques that you're doing, don't they kind of make the case for earlier transplantation, you know, all these different ones? Because, I, I mean, and obviously the, the partial heart for sure, and then this heart thymus secondarily. I mean, does it make the case for the, the option that maybe for the long term of the child for less operations that it would make that an option sooner than later? I think so. I, I think that if you knew, so when you do a heart transplant, the, the clock starts ticking. Probably. Right. 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 You, we, we know that that hearts last you know, the graft survival for hearts is somewhere between 10 and 15 years. Now, it's a little bit better for babies who get hearts within their infancy period that those are more like 20 years or a little bit more than 20 years. So um, but nonetheless, the clock starts ticking and yeah. and you think we put a heart in. Well, we're going to have to think about what, what we're going to do in 15 years from now right. and then what we're going to do in 15 years from then. And yeah. so. Uh, that's one of the issues. The other issue is just having availability of the hearts and, yeah. um, and not having enough enough hearts available. That's why I think a lot of the you know we're talking about these different these different techniques, and they really all are intertwined. You know, we're trying yeah. to increase the donor pool by doing more de- you know donation after circulatory death heart transplants. We're trying to use hearts that maybe the maybe the heart functions poor that there's no way we could do a heart transplant on. And let's let's save a child by giving them valves that grow with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and then the thymus heart, um, you know, if you don't have, if you have tolerance and you're not, you're recognizing that transplanted heart itself, theoretically, that heart's not going to be a 15 year graft survival. Right. That's going, going to be a 50 year graft survival heart. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think they, they all work together. And that's, that's kind of, I think that's a big reason why we've, we've done all of these different, um, you know, these different uh, innovations because they, they do all play off of one another. Yeah. Does it feel to you almost like the stars are aligning in the, in the time that you're working? Because it's pretty incredible how they do fit together. And obviously I, I think of congenital heart surgery and congenital heart disease as like, even as families and as physicians, like standing on the shoulders of the people before us, the parents who first agreed to those early surgeries have given kids years, the surgeons who tried things that failed, you're here, you know, you're doing this today. Like, does it feel a little bit almost like serendipitous the way these are all coming together at this time? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I am, you know, I'm just so incredibly fortunate that this has all happened. And I mean, I just can't tell you how exciting it was. I mean, I, when I went back, I remember the, that first partial heart transplant and, uh, you know, I got home at, I don't know, maybe 1 a.m. or so after, after that was done. I couldn't sleep. I'm sure. You know, I really couldn't. I was just, I was just so thrilled because I, uh, you know, I sensed that this is, this is going to have such implications down the road um, yeah. that it was just, it was too exciting to, you know, to, to be able to sleep at that point. Yeah. Well, so let's talk a little bit about that as a physician. Like when you have a great day and you're you're seeing these advancements happening, like what does that feel like? Like what's that car ride home? That's what I asked Dr. Amani. I said, you know, when things are great, 
what's the car ride home like when things are really not so great and you've had a hard day? What does that feel like? I think that's a question that a lot of parents and patients are curious about. Do you mind sharing that about yourself? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, we talk about glass half full and glass half empty yeah. type of people. I'm a glass 99% full all the time. All you right. know, I, I'm, a, I'm a very positive person and, and um, uh, you know, I, it's an incredible, and I, so as such, I get, you know, these incredible highs with, with doing yeah. these kind of things. And, you know, for me, it's, it's such a, you know, it's such a great feeling to have even just the, the regular day to day. I mean, I'm, we're just so fortunate in what we do as pediatric heart surgeons, you know, yeah. every day um, feels good, you know, and every day it feel you, you feel like you've done something to help a child and to help a family. Mm-hmm. The innovation part of things, I, I, I love even more because it allows you to scale that yeah. and, and, to, and to, to really kind of extend your tentacles on who you can, who you can do good for uh, through that. So, you know, I feel great every day just by operating and, and you know, and being able to, to, to give good care to, to kids who need it. But I feel especially great after some of these innovations and, and watching this kind of thing take off. And this partial heart is going to, it's going to take off. I've, I've, you know, my colleagues around the country, we've, we've spoken a lot, I've spoken to Dr. Amani a lot about this yeah. and, and uh, uh, this, is, this will take off and, and um, more people will benefit from this for sure. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing about it too, is there are programs all over the country, right? Trying to build valves that grow with kids. I mean, yeah. you know, we've all heard about them and know about them and parents are always worried about that. So, you know, this is, I'm not saying, you know, those aren't important research opportunities, but it just seems like there's something really special here yeah. that I think yeah. yes. really has a lot of implications. Yeah. So, the opposite side of things, right? Yes, opposite <laughs> so, yeah, side. Yeah, yeah, you, you would ask about It'd be the hard for a glass half full person, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's the reality yeah. of what you do. Yeah, it is, and there's there is that reality, and and yeah. um, not everything goes well, and yeah. and um, you know that's I've I think we all wrestle with this. This is a this is a hard thing for for anyone uh, to deal with because you want the best for your patients, and and. Um, and you can't help to feel, even if it, if it's out of your control, that you know that, that take it personally, sure. and, and and you develop relationships with your with your patients and families, and and uh, so I think it's very hard. I I think the way that I've always that I've always gotten through it is, you know, I just do my best. I know I'm providing great care for the kids. Um, you know, I don't think that the outcome, unfortunately, would have been different had it been done somewhere else. And I just, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, you've got to find some way to be able to cope with it because it can, yeah. it could tear you up otherwise, I think, um, to deal with yeah. that kind of thing on a regular basis. Yeah. And then prevent you from being able to do the stuff for the You got to wake up the next day we'll and you've again. got somebody else's baby, yeah. right? So yeah. you've got to figure out a way to be able to, you know, kind of move forward. One thing I don't, I don't like to do though, is I don't like to, you know, I, I don't think it's, I don't like to distance myself, uh, as, as kind of a, a technique, you know, it's really kind of funny. The, uh, that Gray's anatomy, um, episode where they have the partial heart, one of the, as they're standing around the patient's bedside and the, and the mother is crying and, and they're talking about this idea of maybe doing a partial heart transplant, uh, the medical student, or maybe it's the resident is doing some finger exercises or whatever. And they ask him about it afterwards. And he says, well, that's my way of di- distracting myself from oh, yeah. the emotions that are, that are going on. And, uh, you know, I've, I've not never been that kind of person. And I, I don't know if I ever want to want to be that kind of person. Yeah. Yeah. But it's big stuff that you guys are doing. And, you know, I think as, as a parent, I will say that we are so appreciative of your work and we want you to get up the next day and do it again for another family. And I think that, you know, one of the things that's always a gift to me, you know, is that people have told me so many times how they've learned from everything that my son went through and helped them to do it differently for somebody else. And I think that that's always an important acknowledgement to make that it's kind of back to what I said, like, we keep standing on each other's shoulders. So we need, you got to keep going, right? I mean, we have to keep going. So, you know, a couple other questions before we leave, because I know your time is precious, but, you know, how do you 
center yourself? Like, how do you take care of your own physical heart? You're clearly a super busy, <laughs> energetic person. I know you have a family. Like, how do you, would you have any practices or things that you do that kind of help you stay centered and healthy yourself? Yeah, I just think it's important to have a very balanced, a balanced life. And I try to make sure that I balance my time, my work time, you know, and, and that's, that's hard sometimes. I mean, yeah. you might go a week where you, you're doing multiple transplants and you're up multiple nights in a week. But, but in general, over the long haul, I, I like to balance, balance my time between my work, between my personal health. You know, I, I run and bike and um, between family time, I coach my boys basketball teams, oh, wow. and, you know, and then, and then just, you know, social time. I've, you know, yeah. I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm an extrovert. I like being around people and, and I like to do that. So, so I, I felt that I've, I've done a, a good job of that in my career. And I think that's one of the things that's been really important for me to derive so much satisfaction out of my work is the fact that I've, I've been able to balance my life outside of work really well. Hmm. That's, and that's gotta be challenging, right? Because you're, you're pulled and you love your work so much. So I, I'm sure that might be a bit of a challenge at times too. It is. And there are weeks where you're just, you know, you know, where, where there is no life other than work, sure, right? Where you're, you're just completely into it. But, you know, I think in the, yeah, in the long haul, I try to make sure that it's, a, it's, it's more of a balanced life. Yeah. That's awesome. So I'm wondering, I, I have two kind of final questions for you. Um, one is like, do you have like one or two secrets for your success? Like if you could look back over your career and your life at this point, are there, is there a lesson or a person or an idea that you feel like really has helped you be the person that you are? Yeah, I think it's a lot. It's, it's definitely a multifactorial sure. situation. Um, mine starts with, I have a very supportive family. Um, and I have a, a large extended family um, in addition to my wife and, and three kids. And, you know, my wife and I have been together now for 28 years, something like that. And, and you know, she, you know, really, she's used to it. She's been through the, sure. <laughs> she's been through the whole thing. And the, the training is, the training is the hardest part. Yeah. And, and so she's been there for, so, so I have a very supportive family, a very supportive wife. Um, I have outstanding colleagues. I've been lucky that I've been surrounded over the years by truly outstanding colleagues. Um, and, and that makes a big difference. It really right. does. And some of the more important things that I've done uh, since I've been at Duke was recruiting right, the right people uh, to come and join our team. And because uh, I realize how important that is. It is. I've had influential, influential mentors. And I talked about Dr. Castaneda and, and how, how important he was to my to my life and my career. And so I think that's important. And uh, I think another secret is I, I, I just I just have a really inquisitive mind. I'm, I'm always, it's kind of that whole notepad at the side of the bed thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of tells you what, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's been important and, and, and just then a really a strong work ethic and motivation to, to, carry, to carry it out. Mm -hmm. Those are great. Those are really good learning tools for, for all of us and for anyone listening. So this season on the Heart Strong podcast, I'm focusing on like who we become in our lives and what we create in the world from the heartaches that we witness in others. So in the families that you serve in your case and, and, and the ones that we face ourselves. And I think through that process, like we become people, better versions of ourselves, I think. And so I'm just wondering like, what is something that you can say, I really like about Joe Turek today because of the things that you've witnessed and the challenges that you have faced in your, either whether it's personal or career, you're like, this is something that I'm really happy about right now. I think it's my positivity. And mm -hmm. I've always been, I've always been a very positive person. Um, but with all that I've been through uh, in just in my career and, yeah. and um, I think it's, it's really reinforced and it's made me a more positive person. And it, it's, it seems a little bit counterintuitive in the sense that, you know, when you've seen a lot of heartache and, and um, you know, sometimes that can be hard, but I think what I've, what I've been able to do is, is chat, you know, channel my, my work towards trying to help so that people don't have to experience that heartache maybe, or not as many people have to experience that heartache and, and to be able to just give people, people hope. Mm, that's awesome. Well, Dr. Turek, thank you so much for spending time with me today. I think your work is 
is transformational. I think it's very important. And I just thank you for following your curiosity because I know you're helping so many people. Thank you. This was, this was a real pleasure. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for joining me here on the HeartStrong Podcast. Please rate and review this podcast and share an episode that you love with a friend. Because when you do, you help us grow our mission of encouraging people to grow through the challenges of their lives and to live their full potential. We'll see you next time.